I read comic books and I was the hero of the comic book. I saw movies and I was the hero in the movie. So every dream that I ever dreamed has come true a hundred times. And you tell me over here, you see these type of people who care, who are dedicated, you realize that it's not possible that they might be building the kingdom of heaven. It's not too far-fetched in reality. I'd like to say that uh, I learned very early in life that without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, a man ain't got a friend. Without, without a song, the road would never bend. Without a song. So I'll keep singing the song. He's the one man who stands alone in the history of rock and roll. He was the first, he was the biggest, and to many, he was the best. He shook the world of music by its very foundation, and he paid the highest price for his success. I'm Casey Kasem. Over the years, I've experienced the world of rock and roll from the inside. I've seen stars come and go, but I have never seen anyone who matched the impact of Elvis Presley. His life was one of extremes, the rebel, the consummate performer, the prisoner of his own demons. We'll see why as we examine the way he lived and the way he died. I want you to experience firsthand the kingdom of the king of rock and roll. Elvis may be gone, but the echo will never die. in the town of Tupelo, Mississippi. While still a child, he moved with his family to Memphis, Tennessee. His young years were etched by the music of the region, and that music fed him the energy and the spirit that took the world by storm. He became a giant with unparalleled speed. He was a teenager thrust into international stardom. He became a legend created by those who loved and protected him and were moved by his music. Yet, he was perceived as a threat to those who resented him and what he stood for. Elvis was controversial from the beginning, a mystery. For more than two decades, his magic created excitement wherever he went. Elvis was a simple man whose life became complex. He was the king of rock and roll, and he loved being Elvis Presley. Elvis was the first man individually to have that uh, sex appeal. And you know, he was a very good looking, good looking man. And I love good looking men. If you're looking for trouble, boom, 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 came to the right place. Boom, 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 boom. If you're looking for trouble, boom, 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 look right in my face. Welcome to Memphis and welcome to Elvis Presley. <laughs> He's been saving for about a year and a half now, a bit, bit of a struggle. Where do you want to go? Vive Elvis, vive la France. Vive la And OK. And vive l'Amérique. I'm the president of the Swedish fan club and arrange a trip every year for the Scandinavian Elvis fans. This is the first uh, publicity shot of uh, Elvis Presley. 310. 310 up front. I guess it does look crazy to everybody. But it's because they don't feel it and they don't understand it. A featured highlight of the tour includes a guided tour through Graceland Mansion. Who's the greatest entertainer in the world? Yeah! That's why we love him. I, I've never written a song. I wish I could. Uh, I wish I was like some of my uh, rivals. Those guys, they're, they're pretty good songwriters, but me, I, I did good to get out of high school, you know? I think he, he saw, when he was growing up, he saw that uh, the black people in the South had a certain feel for music. And I think he, he just loved that music and wanted to, to put it across in his way because until Elvis Presley, nobody was doing that. Only black people, 
you know. And I think he, he heard it and, uh, and liked it. It rubbed off on him. And he felt that he, that he had something to, uh, to give the, the world. And uh, he, nothing was going to stop him. This is Beale Street, the home of the blues. W.C. Handy wrote St. Louis Blues and Memphis Blues right here. David Marsh is a noted journalist, pop critic, and music historian. He's a recognized authority on Elvis. Elvis used to sing back on that corner back there at two clubs called the Paradise and the Handy Club. And in those days, he was the only white boy singing the blues. Elvis wanted to be a great singer in a lot of ways. He wanted to be a blues singer mostly, I think. That was what his real talent was to do. And he admired people like Hal and Wolf, I guess, and Junior Parker, Roy Brown, the great rhythm and blues and, and blues singers of that period. As well, he sang with gospel choirs and stuff like that all around town, black churches and white churches both, which not very many kids did then. Like most black people in the South, and to whose fruit God has pressed down a half of a thousand strings, it only needed tuning. Elvis's voice was that type of voice that agreed with the thought of Calvary. Elvis always loved gospel singers, and his musical inspiration came from gospel songs, the kind of music he sang often in church as a young boy. It remained a major influence throughout his career. That's where I think um, most of us get that feeling of wanting to let loose, just let go. And that was one of the things that Elvis liked. And I think this is one of the things that uh, um, most people, uh, uh, especially fellas, I think, used to think that he was doing that to, to uh, you know, to show off for the ladies. But really, this was just Elvis. That, that's the feeling that he had. He loved to do it. He was a bundle of energy set to music. And that echo will never die. It's a long way from gospel choirs to the top ten, but Elvis was serious about his singing. What he needed was a break. And that break came when he met Sam Phillips, owner of the legendary Sun Records in Memphis. And together with Scotty Moore and Bill Black, they woodshedded for hours and days and months in the studio and finally came up with a record called That's All Right, Mama, which has all that ease and freedom and passion. And when Dewey Phillips played it on WHBQ here in Memphis on his Red Hot and Blue show, that was it. People went berserk. <laughs> Elvis eventually cut five singles for Sun Records and hit the road, touring nonstop. The explosion had begun, and it was too much for Sam Phillips and his small son label to handle. Enter Colonel Tom Parker, who'd come up the ranks of carnivals and sideshows. The Colonel knew what would work with audiences, and in Elvis, he found his greatest act. He bought Elvis's contract for $35,000, the best buy in the history of rock and roll. It would make Tom Parker a millionaire many times over. But since my baby lived, well, I find a place to dwell. Well, it's at the end of lonely street, and heartbreak will tell you. The Colonel and Elvis were a team made in heaven. The king of rock and roll and the master of promotion. Together, they were a gold mine bigger than the big time. But what's interesting to note is that as much as Elvis shook up the country, he never left Memphis. Uh, well, I never thought much about it. I, in fact, I have never thought of marriage. I've never even thought of it. Uh, I'll say this much. Uh, I'm not thinking of it right now, but uh, if I would decide to get married, you know, uh, it wouldn't be a secret. I mean, I'd let everybody know about it, but I have no plans for marriage. I have no specific loves. And I'm not engaged, I'm not going steady with nobody or nothing like that. 
Elvis traveled in the fast lane during his life, but he held very traditional attitudes about women. He worshipped his mother and was devastated by her death. His induction into the Army also caught him off guard, but ever the patriot, he put his career on hold and went off to Germany. There, he met Priscilla, his wife-to-be. She was the only woman who could come close to filling the void left by his mother. While he was in the service, Elvis always insisted on being just one of the boys. Uh, Elvis, uh, uh, since you've been in the Army, have the boys given you kind of a rough time in the barracks because of your past career, would you say? No, sir, I was very surprised. Uh, I, I've never met a, a, a better group of boys in my life. They, uh, they probably would have uh, if it had been like everybody thought. I mean, everybody thought I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't have to work, and I would uh, be given special treatment in this and that. But when they looked around and saw I was I was on KP and I was pulling guard and everything just like they were, well, they figured, well, he's just like us. Have two years of sobering army life changed your mind about rock and roll? Sobering army life? <laughs> uh, no, it hasn't. It, it, it hasn't. It hasn't changed my mind because. I was in tanks for a long time, you see. And uh, they rock and roll quite a bit. Elvis was an instant movie star. His crossover into films became a major media event. He did four before he was drafted in 1958 and eventually starred in 31 features. The first was Love Me Tender in 1956. His favorite was King Creole. He also did two concert films, a total of 33 movies. All were moneymakers. Elvis was first signed by producer Hal Wallace, who had more than 200 films to his credit, including Casablanca. He made nine of the early Elvis pictures for Paramount. Musically, the 60s was a decade of decline for Elvis. The songs he recorded were soundtracks released with the movies, and often they didn't make much sense without the film. But he made a million dollars a picture, a percentage of the profits, and still more from the records. Elvis was a great entertainer, a great personality, uh, someone who uh, created a new style in music that revolutionized the music business. And that is what we bought when we bought him. I was sort of called in by Hal Wallace and said, well, Ursula, you were with us for a year and you misbehaved, and here we have a picture which we would like you to do, it's with Elvis Presley. And the only way I knew Elvis was from television, because this was this new idol who was gonna, you know, this hip-swinging lover with a guitar, and I said, oh my God. And the first day I went to work, and here came over this humble man, full of charm and love in his eyes and, and kindness and being so considerate and warm that I, I was so surprised. Bravo. Uh, that was just a reward from Dolores, that's all. Can anybody get in the act? Only the regular customers. In the grand scheme of things, he could have been exactly in the line of Marlon Brando and James Dean. Um, and he made six of his first seven movies in that tradition. They were tough kid movies, uh, kids with a chip on their shoulder, uh, who hit out at life and at themselves and did a lot of damage. And when Presley was called upon to be bewildered or angry or vicious, he was absolutely believable on the screen. He was actually rather better at it than James Dean. You're a pretty fancy performer, ain't you, kid? Now you know what I do for an encore. I won't get out of here. As it was, we only see the potential Dean or Brando. You know, I remember once, Pop, when I was no more than three feet high, you took me to the circus. You accidentally bumped into some guy, and he turned around and punched you. He punched you right in the mouth, and you know what you did? Nothing. Nothing. When they swing at you, Pop, it's not enough to duck. You gotta swing back. Maybe you can't anymore, but I'm not taking after you. 
You go to school. I'm going out and make a buck. Somewhere along the line, the faith sold him down the river. Because Elvis could have been the best actor, young actor in the world. If they hadn't said, but right here, we got to put in three musical numbers. Because he loved acting. He loved it, man. And I think what my personal opinion is, after doing the formula pictures, the Elvis Presley formula pictures, he just said, the hell with it. Because if they're going to keep me doing this, then ain't no sense of me making pictures anymore. Because how many times can you keep doing the same story, whether it's in a harem, whether it's in a race car, whether it's on, uh, on a farm? But you know, he did some, out of all the films, he did about six or seven that I think he was proud of. And those of us who cared about him on a personal level said, yeah, man, he's cooking, you know. The uh, idea of tailoring Elvis for dramatic roles is something that we never attempted because we did not sign Elvis as a second Jimmy Dean. We signed him as a number one Elvis Presley. I can only assume that the management team that managed Elvis Presley, and that has to include the Hollywood moguls who, who produced the contracts that Colonel Tom Parker signed on Elvis's behalf, they all share the guilt. And it is guilt because they destroyed a potentially very interesting film career. The uh, most successful one was Blue Hawaii. Uh, which uh, some of the carping critics found fault with, but it proved to be the most successful uh, financially and in the response from his fans. It's actually a pity that G.I. Blues and Blue Hawaii, the two most successful of his musicals, were so successful because their success cost him the opportunity to do good work in that his management could point at the balance sheet and say, well, you did Flaming Star and we only made three million dollars. You did Blue Hawaii, we made 30 million dollars. But of course, you kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Most of his movies had a lot of singing, so many of the singles released in the 1960s were soundtracks, far different from the rock and roll that had made him the teen idol of the 50s. I got a call from Elvis, uh, actually Tom Diskin, I think it was, called me. And he asked me if uh, I could go to Los Angeles to do a movie with Elvis. Now, I didn't know whether that meant to play, to be in the movie or whatever, but I, I shortly found out it was to play on the soundtrack. And then I found out that uh, when you did soundtracks, you were also doing records at the same time. Now take Mr. Crawford, baby, shake in your foot hand. He's gonna look good and you're frying pat. If you fry him, Chris, or you boil him right, he'll be sweeter than sugar when you leave your bite. Crawford! We'd get through all of the music in uh, one day, possibly. Uh, usually we would come back and, and uh, make some retakes because they weren't all perfect records by any means. After the Army, the scores really went downhill, except for Doc Pomus and Mort, Mort Schumann, who wrote the Viva Las Vegas score, which is real good. The rest of it was just awful. He had to sing things like Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce. That was a song title. Do the Clam. Uh, there was Song of the Shrimp. Just awful stuff. You couldn't believe that he would get up in the morning and be able to face doing it. A lot of critics came down hard on Elvis for the music that came out of these movies. It wasn't the pure rock and roll that we were accustomed to, but it was good for the box office. You're dealing with publishers, you're dealing with, with uh, songwriters, you're dealing with friends that want you to do a song. I mean, everything you can think of, I think, was thrown at Elvis as far as material goes. We did a number of bad songs. I don't care where we go, so lead on, me amigo. I think I'm gonna like it. While Elvis was making movies in the 1960s, the Beatles and others were busy making music. He hadn't delivered a number one hit in seven years. So when the movie contracts were up, Elvis went back to his Graceland home, searched for good songs, and went to work. He made music history in January 1969. In Memphis, he cut 32 sides in 15 days. So much music that it took a year and a half to release it all. 
The session produced four gold singles and two platinum albums. His return to serious music had begun. You know, it was his second comeback, because he'd come back from the Army, everybody said he was finished. But this comeback was bigger, because he'd been out in public and nobody would ever done it before. And it was like, I remember a feeling of real joy among Elvis fans, because it was like, we got him back. With his recording career on the way again, the second step of the music comeback was to reestablish himself as the number one live performer. He hadn't been on stage in eight years. So in July of 1969, Elvis armed himself with a full orchestra, two backup vocal groups, and set out to conquer the toughest entertainment town in the world. And for 32 incredible nights, it was standing room only. One friend who traveled over the years with Elvis, who handled his business and wrote his checks, recalls an earlier visit to Las Vegas. First time Elvis came to Las Vegas was in 1956, and he bombed, mainly because uh, there was an older crowd, and back then they, they just didn't understand his music, and they thought he was vulgar. But then when he came back in 1969, he took this town by storm. Elvis really didn't have a, a lot of close friends as far as other entertainers were concerned. There were some that he really liked and admired, and some who he talked to, uh, uh, Sammy Davis, Tom Jones. Elvis came to see me in the Flamingo in 68, and um, he said at that time that he, he wanted to come back on stage because that's all he, all he felt. He felt that he was an entertainer, a live entertainer. And that was the most important thing to him. And it's the same thing to me. He said, but when I get on the stage, he said, that's my world. I said, tell me about it. I said, that's what makes me exist. When you get, no matter what the problems are before you go on stage, when you get on that stage, and that's what he had, call it charisma, call it point of view, call it whatever you will, but he had that. And you could see him when he was on that stage working, you know, and everybody's doing this and being afraid that someone's going to come on the stage and the security and everything else. He wasn't. He was out there just doing his thing and making them and having fun with whoever's sitting ringside. And that was his thing. Have fun, you know, and entertain the people to the best of his ability, which he did. around and said it was like working for a glorified stripper but but every movement he made I tried to accent on the drums and it became very much a part of his music and it became very much a part of uh, his training in karate I even started studying karate so I'd be able to anticipate his moves before he would actually finish him before he could sing the first song the audience got up and gave him a standing ovation for at least 10 minutes like hey man welcome back if you do something in Las Vegas, if something happens uh, on stage in Las Vegas, the media picks up on it. As if you're on the road somewhere and something happens, you know, if you split your pants or you, or you forget words or you fall down or, you know, something happens. Uh, a lot of the times it's, it's, it's missed. But in Vegas, it's picked up on. So uh, all those things, it, there's, there's pressure in Vegas. And... Um, if you do well in Vegas, people know about it. To succeed in Vegas and have longevity is the finest compliment that any performer can receive. If you get the support of the people who live there and the support of your, of your people who come out. There's never been an artist in the history of Vegas, I think. You know, I, I, I correct, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's ever been an artist that when his name went on the marquee, uh, they knew he was coming. People came from all over the world. I never, I never heard of that. But with his arrival in Las Vegas, there had come changes. His singing was better than ever. 
But those close to him could notice that Elvis was a different person. Oh, from the first time we met to uh, the last few times I saw him, I noticed changes. Yes, yeah. I noticed changes because he was more, he was more withdrawn. He was more within himself. And the fun, the fun nutty things, came further apart than they used to do. Of course, he was getting older. You know, he'd gone, to, got a marriage, had a kid, blah 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 blah. And those things affect you. And I, I think the there's not a performer alive that doesn't doubt himself at a point. I could see that this uh, the camp wasn't the same, you know, because every time I'd been with him before. Uh, I used to like the way that the, you know, the fellas that worked for him seemed to be uh, all with him, you know, very much with him. But then when I saw that he was having problems, they they started to get uh, like they couldn't handle it or they didn't know what was happening to him. The music comeback was complete in January 1973. Elvis was 38 years old, and the satellite show Aloha from Hawaii proved that he was truly number one. It was telecast live, and he was seen in 40 countries around the world. It was the ultimate achievement by any performer at any time. But there were signs of trouble. I'd just like to say before anything else uh, uh, that uh, it's a great privilege uh, to do the satellite program, and I'm going to do my, my best and all the people that work with me to do a good show, which is pure you know, entertainment. No messages and no this and that. Some say that the satellite show, his greatest achievement, was also his last hurrah. After it, he could have played anywhere he chose, but instead, it was back to a grueling series of one-nighters in many towns he'd played before. I left a good job in the city Working for the man every night and day And I never lost one minute of sleep Worried about the way things might have been A big wheel to keep on turning Proud man to keep on burning Elvis had achieved everything a performer could dream of. But personal problems began to overtake him. The creative fire was gone. He was a different Elvis Presley. It would take only four years. Uh, as long as it lasts, as long as it sells, I'll continue doing it. As long as that's what the people want. And if they change, if it dies out, I'll try to do something else. And if that doesn't work, I'll just say, well, I had my day. In his last four years, Elvis recorded only 30 songs. When out on tour, he retreated to Graceland and tried to recapture those earlier days. But it wasn't the same. His six-year marriage to Priscilla ended in divorce. Health and personal problems increased, and he was overweight. Many old friends were replaced by new ones. On August 16th, 1977, Elvis was found dead in his home at Graceland. He was only 42 years old. When I say I could see the end coming, uh, I could. there were certain nights when we'd get ready to go on stage and to go in to talk to him, and he was hardly even coherent. His eyes would be closed. He'd hardly even open his eyes to talk to you. He would be drowsy. Uh, we doubt whether he would even get through the show or not. There were nights when I just physically just would just pound the drums as hard as I could just to like to kick him in the rear end, you know, to wake up, you know, we're on stage, you know. And there were other nights when he'd come out there wired to the wall, you know, couldn't slow him down for anything, you know. He was just totally wired. And you can't just, you can't, you know, that's destructive. Uh, whatever those reasons were, I don't know. I can't imagine that Elvis could have ended any other way, but that's more because of how people treat other people than it is because of any 
fault in Elvis. Um, if the world was the pure world that I hear when I hear him singing, if I can dream or follow that dream or mystery train, then yeah, I can see Elvis living forever. And I, and I think the Elvis in that music will live forever. Perhaps he was the flawed hero we should all be looking for in the 20th century, in that he had all the gifts and the opportunities and faced with the possibility of anything, destroyed himself by self-abuse, by possibly by drugs, possibly by listening to wrong advice, by indulging his other weaknesses and not realizing how fortunate he was and understanding that a certain discipline is necessary. And we live in, in the first age that had the ability to destroy itself completely. Um, and Elvis seems perhaps a symbol of all that possibility going to waste and just ending without any warning. You see, Elvis was such a phenomenon that when people see a man uh, so big as Elvis was, go the way he went, you know, and dying the way he did, I think that, uh, that it affects people and, and, and makes them wonder, you know, how could that happen to a man like that? And it's, uh, it's, it, in that way, it's, it's, it's tragic. But I think Elvis Presley was basically uh, a down-home person, you know, and a, and a real person. I think he just, uh, not pointing any fingers at any, at any you know, body that, that was around him, but I think if he'd had a few more friends close to him, then he would be alive today. Who can survive with this burden of success? I don't know, because he had a, a, such a success that it, it, it confined him to this, you know, to this cage he had to live in without any freedom at all. And I remember the last party he invited me to, and he was telling me what a strain it you is. He said, do it happen to you? I said, yeah, but not like it does you. He couldn't even move around the place without bodyguards or somebody being close to him all the time. I usually maybe have somebody around sometime. He had to have them all the time. There's a big buildup of something else that takes place before you finish yourself off inadvertently. Uh, I wish he hadn't done it. But then again, I know a lot of people that, that do that kind of thing to themselves every day uh, for reasons uh, amounting to much less pressure than Elvis had on him. Uh, you know, I remember in the early years he used to say, hey man, if it all stops now, I'll just look back and say it was great. But I don't think he could have done that in the later years. Uh, what kept him going is that, that he wanted to continue being Elvis Presley. It ain't my business what he did. Only thing I want to know, was he my friend? Did I enjoy him as a performer? Did he give the world of entertainment something? Yes, on all counts. And that's the name of that tune. You understand what I mean? Good. Because without the jazz, no matter. There's more than music to keep the echo of Elvis Presley alive. Memories from Graceland, from those who knew him best. There, Elvis could confide in people like Bill Morris, who became county sheriff and went on to become mayor of Memphis. He was probably the only uh, non-paid Secret Service agent ever in the country uh, as a volunteer or an honorary position because uh, uh, the, the president of the United States bestowed that honor on him. First cousin Billy Smith, whose family moved to Memphis with the Presleys in 1948. His mother uh, couldn't have any more children after Elvis was born and all, so she became very protective of it. In fact, she was so protective, even while he was in high school, uh, she used to hide behind a bush and follow him home after school. Joe Smith, married to Billy, they both lived at Graceland. He liked um, badges. He collected um, badges from all over, everywhere, all kind of police badges. He, he even had a uh, police uniform. Marty Lacker, a high school friend who helped him take care of business. One time he said, do you, how many people do you know that can write a check for a million dollars and get it cashed? Patsy Lacker, Marty's wife. They lived with Elvis, too. He didn't even get himself a glass of water from the faucet. Somebody, one of the guys would always have a glass of water sitting there for him when it was time for him to come down. Pat Perry, his Beverly Hills hairdresser who saw him laugh and saw him cry. 
when I started cutting men's hair, I started cutting some of the guys' hairs around him, and he didn't want to miss out on anything, so he says, you've got to cut my hair. That scared me to death, you know, but I did it, and he loved it, you know, and it was like, it, it, I traveled with him wherever he went, and uh, just whenever he needed it, but he kept me around because he liked me, because it was fun, you know, he was like my big brother. Kong Ree, the Memphis karate teacher who named him Mr. Tiger. And uh, his uh, movement is so uh, unique and uh, so, uh, you know, entertaining and so uh, beautiful. Uh, he's the uh, total man. Harry Levitch, a Memphis jeweler and friend for 20 years. He made the wedding rings for Elvis and Priscilla. You know, he always called me Mr. Levitch. I could never make him call me Harry. Uh, I was older than him, and he, he was just taught that he should call older men Harry. What was Elvis really like? Who knows better than those who were close to him? He just wanted to have enough money in his bank account to write a check, to buy anything he wanted to buy, whenever he wanted to buy. All the jewelry that he wore on stage was all real. The first thing I ever sold Elvis was an electric mixer. Well, Elvis had a, a great desire to make people happy, and he thought that giving people material things was very, very important. Two days later, he came back in. And he said, Mr. Levis, can you get me another electric mixer? And I said, certainly, who will this be for? And he said, this was for Mama, too. He said, you know, I've decided that I've made a little bit extra money, and I'm going to put one at each end of the kitchen so she won't have to walk so much. One Christmas, particularly, uh, as another example of his interest in people and giving and seeing them happy, we were in an automobile agency. Uh, just before Christmas, and uh, a black lady was in there and looking at cars, obviously, just looking. And uh, very quickly, he moved over to where she was, and he said, you like that car? And she said, I sure do. He said, how would you like to have that for Christmas? She said, oh, there ain't no way. And uh, he said, well, that sure is. I said, I just bought it for you. I remember during the movie years, every night for two years straight, he had meatloaf, mashed potatoes and sliced tomato for supper. He used to carry little jello squares and munch on those, you know, because they were less fattening and everything. He couldn't care less about business. He never made any investments, uh, and his money was never invested for him. He talked baby talk to most of the girls he dated. Most people, guys, when they play touch football, they go out in a vacant lot or in their backyard and play. Not Ellis. He went out and rented the stadium. He bought complete uniforms, helmets, pads, everything for everybody on his team. Sometimes we even had cheerleaders. That's the way he liked to play touch football. Priscilla was the woman of the house of Graceland. Uh, when Lisa was born, Elvis was like walking on air. He was so proud. He was gutsy. He was much of a man. I wish that everybody would have a chance to share the life of a man like him. And uh, one day he wrote down a little, uh, on a piece of paper, his philosophy for a happy life for me. Someone to love, something to look forward to, and something to do. I miss him a lot. The death of Elvis resulted in an unbelievable outpouring of sympathy and exploitation. Each year, some half million people visit Graceland to pay homage to their fallen idol, an unprecedented phenomenon. Hero worship like the world has never seen. We still have plenty of Graceland tickets left available to tour through Elvis' home, Graceland Mansion. Don't miss this exciting Elvis Memorial Tour, featuring the highlights of the life and times of Elvis Presley. A featured highlight of the tour includes a guided tour through Graceland Mansion and a guided tour through the world-famous Turn Recording Studio. Plenty of good tickets are still left available at Storyline, located across the I've been coming down, I guess, about 15 years. And uh, there's a bunch of us that used to come down here and sit around, wait for Elvis, you know, just wait for him to come out, follow him to the movies. He was always friendly to the fans. No matter how long you stayed here, you could be here till 4 or 5 in the morning, and he never ran them off. I think he has uh, many all of characters of human beings. For example, sometimes wild, timid, strong, and weak, and sad, and good. 
Many characters he. That's why we love him. Some of these people here, they got two jobs. They're not wealthy. They're just ordinary people. Mum's always liked Elvis. And Dad's always liked Elvis. We've always heard his music. <laughs> Ever since he first started, when I was 16, 17. He just cared so much for people. And throughout the years, you know, he just, he said, if it wasn't for my fans, man, I, you know, I just wouldn't be where I am today and I wouldn't have the things that I have. And so I thanked him. And the best way he thanked him was to entertain him and make him feel loved. When Elvis died, it was absolutely clear to me that he would become more popular in death than he had in life because immediately he died, the disappointments of a badly handled career and a disintegrating personal life were no longer relevant. They could be forgotten. We could choose to remember what we wanted about this president. 310 up front. 330. 330 up front. 380. 380 up front. 400 over on the side. 450. <laughs> Five big ones over on the side. Five big ones. So, five hundred dollars. When he died, in terms of commercial popularity, uh, he became a social phenomenon. The one star who would be larger after death than in life. And his fans won't ever forget him. It is like a religious experience, because most of them have felt their love, as it's always described for Elvis, with such intensity that having once felt it, this is something they'll never let go of. And although it may become embarrassing to those who don't share it, as the years go by, the ones who do will work even harder to relive it and to bring it back. And consequently, these jamborees in Memphis, necrophiliac jamborees, if you like, will become bigger and louder and more popular as the years go by. I learned very early in life that without a song, today would never end. Without a song, a man ain't got a friend. Without, without a song, the road would never bend. Without a song. So I keep singing a song. Somewhere I know There's a blue
Before he died, Elvis recorded more than 600 songs and became the king of the charts. He had more hit albums than any artist in history. He had the most gold singles, the most gold albums, the most number ones as a solo artist. He had starred in 33 successful movies, and his concerts were always sold out. Elvis Presley was and is a billion dollar industry. Elvis, the echo will never die. I hope you've enjoyed this look at Elvis. He was a complex man, sophisticated, yet childlike. Puritanical, but in many ways excessive. But whatever Elvis was, he was loved. And he'll forever be the king of rock and roll. I'm Casey Kasem. Thanks for watching.